Hello all, and thanks for tuning in to the online launch of Killing at its Very Extreme, October 1917 to November 1920. Darren Kelly, my co-author and I, I'm Derek Mullen, you have written a chronological account of the War of Independence over two volumes, this being the first, based in Dublin in what is rightly regarded as the cockpit of Ireland's revolution. We have written the book published by Mercier Press in our own unique style. Many of you who have read our previous works will be familiar with that style. It is forensic, unflinching, and utterly gripping. We have picked up right where our previous book, Those of Us Who Must Die, left off in the autumn of 1917. Those of Us Who Must Die is itself a successor to our first book in this series, When the Clock Struck in 1916. In this sense, Killing at its very extreme is the third book in a series of four, so far at least, dealing with Ireland's struggle during the revolutionary years. The fourth, which deals with the period between November 1920 and July 1921, is due for release next spring, also published by Mercier Press. Over the course of both our volumes on the War of Independence, Darren and I feel that we have carved a new path in Irish history by creating what we see as the first such account of the war, in such a format. Needless to say, there are scores, hundreds even, of worthy books about this war, but they tend to focus on particular aspects and players, or to fragment their narratives into individual aspects and deal with each other. Darren and I have sought to do otherwise, and tell the entire incredible story from start to finish in an accessible way that illuminates what it was actually like to be there, to feel like you're witnessing the events as you turn the pages. Our intention is to wrench the reader into the events as if you were standing there watching them unfold. This gargantuan task has not been easy. As we progressed through the writing of this book, we began to understand why we'd been told by other writers that we were mad to take this on, given its scope. However, once the wheels on this work had properly hit the tracks, the overall narrative began to slot together. This is when the story of the war, which we thought we already knew pretty much everything about, really drew us in and took hold. To study in such depth the clandestine machinations of an underground army, assisted by countless civilians from all backgrounds, as well as political allies, not to mention organised labour, taking to task the mightiest empire the world had known, from the city streets we walk each day, to witness what was plotted and executed behind Dublin's picturesque Georgian facades, as well as both its fashionable and its less salubrious thoroughfares, has been a breathtaking journey. Having taken that journey, we now, in launching this book, invite you to step on board and enjoy what was truly a breathtaking ride. The journey begins with the reorganisation of the Irish volunteers under their new leaders in late 1917. Then. Following the arrival of Ireland's new Viceroy, Lord French, the German plot arrests of early summer 1918 are detailed in conjunction with the conscription crisis. The role of Dick McKee is explored here, as elsewhere throughout the book. As Dublin Brigade commander, McKee was instrumental in masterminding and overseeing most of the war in England until his violent death early Sunday in November 1920. McKee has been completely overshadowed by more high profile figures from the war. This was in no small part because so effective at keeping his profile so low that the British knew very little about him, even when they had captured him. We have shone a new and long overdue light on Dick McKee and his close associate, Patter Clancy. We then draw the reader into the conspiracy to assassinate the British War Cabinet in Westminster. This is followed by the end of the Great War, in tandem with the arrival of the Spanish flu to Ireland Joss. Coffins in what is today St. James's Hospital were stacked by the dozen as the city and country grappled with the worst pandemic since the bubonic plague. Yet in the midst of this, the December 1918 election paved the way for the first doll. There were celebrations throughout the city following its inauguration, as well as an ominous sense that Ireland had crossed another route, particularly with the solar headbag shootings of the same day. However, we also explore the shootings and killings that had preceded solar headbag. The war, we would argue, was already well underway before that fateful day. Nonetheless, 
Cafes, bars and restaurants were filled with people celebrating the doll's advent. It's interesting to look back from the current context to witnessing pubs, restaurants and other such establishments, similarly to today, closed due to the pandemic, but with many reopening riding high on the momentary wave of optimism. We illustrate what Dublin was like during several lockdowns. Each Easter saw the city effectively blockaded. There were curfews as things escalated, and escalate they most certainly did. Amid a series of breathtaking prison escapes and arms raids, the intelligence war in spring 1919 gained a prominence that would eventually see Ireland as a model studied by intelligence agencies the world over. We explore in detail how this war unraveled through the eyes of not just Michael Collins, but through others such as Liam Tobin, Tom Cullen, Frank Thornton, Lily Vernon, Ned Broy, David Nelligan, Jim McNamara, and a host of others who did most of the day-to-day -day work under Collins' overall direction. Inevitably, Collins himself becomes the focus of our attentions. His astonishing pluck and daring saw IRA intelligence initially run rings around the enemy, but not for long. British intelligence did hit back with the Dublin Metropolitan Police G-men of G Division. Following the announcement by Eamon de Valera that the Royal Irish Constabulary were to be boycotted and ostracised, they began to close in, but were summarily dispatched in the brutal fashion that began to characterise the war. We do not hold back in detailing how such measures were played out. More effective agents were deployed by British. IRA intelligence was in fact penetrated by one agent in particular, calling himself Jemison. He was later described as the very best the British Secret Service had to offer. On several occasions, his handiwork came hair-raisingly close to collapsing the entire house of cards that was IRA intelligence. His efforts, which included identifying the positions of Michael Collins and several other senior IRA players, ultimately cost him his life, but would have far-reaching consequences as things moved on. In late 1919, we had several assassination attempts on Lord French. Time after time, however, he outwitted his enemies, at least until the Ashtown ambush. This was when 13 IRA members, including the four men from Tipperary, Sean Tracy, Dan Green, James Robinson and Sean Hogan, known as the Big Four, came within a hair's breadth of killing French and is recounted along with so many other ambushes and attacks, such as those carried out by the Dublin Brigade squad in spellbinding and unprecedented detail. Ashtown changed everything. Without so much as an inkling of the attack from their own intelligence services, Lord French was horrified. Countermeasures were swift and backfired spectacularly. Internment was reintroduced. Royal Navy destroyers dropped anchors off Dunleary, ready to ship internees to England. A new police chief was sent from Belfast to reinvigorate the force, following the killings of the several detectives who had ignored warnings to back off in their pursuit of Republicans. The same police, by the way, who had tormented and ridiculed three years earlier in Richmond Barracks. The new chief lasted just three weeks before his brains were blown out in Harcourt Street. At this point, G Division was all but finished. Another agent was brutally gunned down outside the international bar. Then another, Alan Bell, painted as an elderly civil servant, pursuing behind the growing revolution, but with a far more sinister mandate from Scotland Yard, was dragged off a packed tram in Balls Bridge and brutally executed. As his body was laid out on a slab that very night in hospital, IRA members next door in an arms dump toasted his death with champagne. Mountjoy Prison saw mass hunger strikes, assisted from the outside by a general strike. The British were forced to back down, completely demoralising the police and military. The Black and Tans arrived to bolster the police as assassinations and killings became the norm throughout Ireland, as did the horrific reprisals now unleashed in conjunction with the Black and Tans' arrival. Huge own goals were scored in propaganda terms as it was made abundantly clear to the British that Ireland was not some distant colony where such dreadful acts would go unreported. Far from it. Republican propaganda rang rings around Dublin Castle and Westminster. All the while, the underground government established itself, displaying the numbers of journalists and reporters from throughout the world with their eyes now trained on Ireland that this was not some fly-by-night idealistic venture but a working alternative to an outmoded establishment 
with no mandate that in its death throes was lashing out blindly in a manner more suited to the recent German occupation of Belgium. A new British commander, General McCready, was sent to re-establish order. He arrived utterly detesting the country to which he had been posted without prejudice to nationalist or unionist, but with a new plan. Vast tracts of the countryside deemed ungovernable since the IRA's now year-old strategy of driving the Royal Irish Constabulary from rural Ireland were to be retaken by mobile units. McCready cried out for martial law, but his government vacillated. Nonetheless, armadas of military trucks and transports arrived to drive his strategy forward. But then, Irish dock and rail workers, my father among the latter, refused to handle or transport military equipment and men. The general now had to use his fleet in transportation as opposed to tactical roles. His strategy was scuppered. As things ratcheted up, there were police mutinies. The conflict spread to Northern Ireland as the groundwork was laid for partition. Derry saw the worst street fighting in Ireland since Easter 1916. Belfast saw horrific pogroms after Edward Carson fueled the hatred, now starting to consume Ulster. Meanwhile, British agents poured into Dublin and began to make ground. Then, the arrival of the auxiliaries brought a new dynamic to the fight. It started to look like the IRA had met its match for a time in Dublin. However, whilst the IRA was thrown momentarily onto the back foot, the propaganda war went into overdrive. Terence McSweeney's hunger strike in Brixton Prison, alongside the similar sacrifices of other less prominent hunger strikers in Cork, saw the world's press converge upon London and on Ireland. Among the onlookers in London was 30-year-old Ho Chi Minh, later to lead North Vietnam in the Vietnam War. He commented, referring to McSweeney, a nation that has such citizens will never surrender. In early autumn 1920, the IRA in Dublin and throughout the country desperately fought back, but struggled to hold ground. In Dublin, this led to breathtaking escapes and lethal gun battles on the city streets, now patrolled by armoured cars and tanks. During one such battle, 18-year-old Kevin Barry was captured. His subsequent detention, court martial and execution are covered in vivid and graphic detail in the book, as is the notorious sacking of Balbriggan, which took place on the same day as Barry's capture. Balbriggan, just 20 miles from Dublin city centre, was well within reach of the world's press. Journalists converged in battalions. Looking on his rooms afterwards, a senior British civil servant named Andy Cope, part of a team drafted in during the spring to reinvigorate what were called the woodenly stupid administrators of Dublin Castle, told his Irish girlfriend that British rule in Ireland was nothing more than a great spoof. Dublin City was gripped like a vice during autumn 1920, with a tension that leaps from the pages of this book. We recount how the IRA suffered a series of devastating blows, how Dublin Castle's resurgent intelligence services, spearheaded by Colonel Ormond Winter, a man unburdened with empathy or conscience, and with a persona more suited to that of a James Bond villain, encroached relentlessly and regained ground. As the Crown began to re-establish itself in the city, General McCready, however, looked on ominously, sensing correct that there was still plenty of sting left in the enemy's tail. The tribulations of the civilians caught up in this maelstrom are explored. Their homes constantly subjected to raids, their menfolk prone to be whisked away in the night, their bedrooms ransacked by enemy soldiers, some of whom looked on in horror at the behaviour of comrades, and did their best to mitigate the situation with small acts of kindness and humanity. Such acts were, however, few and far between in this vicious and unforgiving war for which the rule book had long since been torn up. Autumn 1920 also saw clandestine peace feelers gaining traction. The irony of war illuminated through the eyes of Patrick Moylet, a back channel envoy sent by Sinn Féin to Downing Street to talk peace. While at home, his company a front for arms imports, astonishingly, held the Irish distribution rights for Nobel explosives. But all wars are laced with such absurdities, and typically, Dublin being the town it is, the book is not wanting in its share of hilarious and frequently slapstick anecdotes. Needless to say, with Harry Boland and Michael Collins, whose misadventures at times are conspicuously hilarious, there is plenty of light-hearted relief. 
But it's not just such prominent characters who drive our story. It's the foot sloggers from both sides that make history what it really is. We strive to visualize it from their perspective, to step into the shoes of our forebearers as they did the impossible. In the case of this book, we conclude in the lead up to Bloody Sunday. Our next work picks up the baton from this point and brings us right up to the July troops. We sincerely believe that this book will open a new window into Dublin's and Ireland's past. It's written in a typically energetic manner that we feel encapsulates the spirit of the time when the impossible really was achieved. As Ireland continues to celebrate her decade of centenaries, it remains a privilege for Darren and me to add another slice of our participation in our own unique style. We truly hope you will enjoy this book and that adds to the richness of our country's incredible history. History is what makes us who we are. It's the compass that guides us through a turbulent present and helps us plot a course to less troubled waters. Knowing that our ancestors have weathered the types of storms recounted by historians in books such as this is something that can help ground us, provide perspective, and remind us that our toughest days are but momentary patchworks to the wonderful tapestry that is life. I feel, and I speak for Darren also when I say that what Dublin and Ireland achieved in the decade we now commemorate is something that we feel deeply honoured to present to the world. For this opportunity, we would sincerely like to thank all at Mercy or Press, particularly Mary and Deirdre, whose enthusiasm for this project has inspired us. Thank also to Hodges Figgis Bookshop on Dawson Street, and thanks to all of you, to all who have helped and encouraged us in so many ways, to our readership and supporters in Ireland, Britain, throughout Europe and the world, we hope you enjoy the book and find it as rewarding to read as we did to write. Thank you.